Welcome to Out of the Fog. I'm Melissa Royal Critch. Tonight we have an unbelievable amount of talent here in our studio. We have a number of the musical guests from this weekend's upcoming uh, Newfoundland Symphony Orchestra Big Ticket event. We have Geraldine Hollett from The Once, Andrew James O'Brien from Fortunate Ones, and Sherman Downey, along with the CEO of the NSO, uh, Hugh Dunnan. And they're here to talk about this fantastic night um, where they're taking Newfoundland and Labrador artists that you know and love and backing them with the full sound of the Newfoundland Symphony Orchestra. Then we're joined by the co-hosts of Podco, a political podcast uh, made right here in St. John's, um, featuring uh, Dr. Laura Lee Oates, Dr. Lucian Ashworth, and Dr. Stephen Tomlin. And they're going to chat with us about the Liberal Leadership Contest all kicked off this week, as well as some broader concepts about democratic reform and what you can expect to hear on this upcoming season of their podcast. Stay tuned. We'll be right back with more Out of the Fog. It was my daughter's birthday. She was blowing out the candles on her cake when we heard coming from the TV. So we stopped and listened, and it helped us get to safety. That's why when I think of I think of my daughter's birthday, because now she gets to keep having them. Welcome back to Out of the Fog. We are here with an all-star crew of musicians uh, from Newfoundland and Labrador, all here for the NSO's Big Ticket Fundraiser this Friday night. Welcome to the show, Hugh, Geraldine, Sherwin, and uh, Andrew. Hello. Hello. Andrew James. I don't know if I start if I start off first. Is Andrew James I'm O'Brien? I'm happy. Say? You can call me whatever you like. <laughs> happy to be here. <laughs> Wonderful. So the big event is on Friday night. I can't believe you got all of these talented musicians and more. Some of them are on the poster behind you here to join. So tell us about this uh, fundraiser happening yeah, we tonight. Yeah, really, we really lucked out this year. So we really wanted to come back to our Newfoundland roots. We had the tenors last year. So this year we thought we'd come back to some of the greatest local artists we know of. And so we picked, we think, three, or I should say four, really, of the greatest artists uh, in the Wants, Fortunate Ones, and Sherman Downey and Matthew Burns. So we're really excited and, uh, and looking forward to Friday night. And Geraldine, of course, you are with uh, The Once, one of my favorite bands. No offense to these guys. No hey. offense. No one, offense. One, of, one of my three favorite, no, one of my favorite bands, and a, a very popular, of course, uh, group in this province. But you've, um, you've done this fundraiser before. You've actually played with the NSO before. We've done it before, and we've done a couple songs, and now we'll do, it's, it's, it feels like we're doing more now. Trust us now. We, oh, yeah. That's that was, good. that first was the audition, yeah. and now okay. it's well, that's so now, now, Okay, you, you yeah. Up to the big <laughs> leagues. <laughs> and what does it feel like to play with an orchestra behind you? You know, there's three of you and there's other musicians on stage with you often but th that's a big difference to have the whole crew it feels like you can fly and I'm not kidding and it also feels like if if you're not smart or you don't like brace yourself you could cry the whole night like there are times when you just break you're like oh no I'm not gonna get this song because they're so full I mean you can't imagine how it surrounds you it makes you feel like a million bucks, really. There's nothing like it. I might sit down in the middle of it and forget <laughs> to sing, but we'll see. <laughs> I won't, because I'm professional. Understood. Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 yeah. Understood. But we'll yeah. understand if you do. Yeah. yeah. Well, if I do, it's your fault. Well, yeah. You tell them it's <laughs> their yeah, fault. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. We'll keep playing till you come back in. Okay, <laughs> thanks. All right, good. <laughs> and Sherman, you also played with uh, the Newfoundlands of the Orchestra. Yeah, I guess That's it was what back in 2009 with the release of the second album, full band at that point. So yeah. I think there were six of us on stage. But there are moments when you want to turn around and just stop playing and listen. listen. Yeah. Being so close. You yeah. Know? yeah well, really lucky you get to listen to each other's performances, maybe yeah. from the wings. Um, so how does the process go about picking what songs you're going to play? Last year, you, last time you said it was just after the release of one of your albums. Yeah. Um, you know, do you like playing covers or your own music with them? How does that work? Yeah, well, this year I'm actually, I guess the, the LPs, the vinyl, new yeah. vinyl is on the way this week. So I'm, I'll week. have the new album out very soon. So we're going to try two songs off the new album. Yeah. No way. Yeah. Great. <laughs> and Andrew, uh, with the fortunate ones, sorry, fortunate ones. I said I wasn't going to say the fortunate ones. It's fortunate ones. Totally fine. <laughs> <laughs> if this was the Eagles and you said it, 
Don Henley would flip a table. <laughs> that's why they got. That's why they got it to the floor. It's all good. Yeah. Right. Well, at least we can call it the out of the fog. Hundred um, percent. You and Kat. So your music. Are you going to be playing? I guess I'm, I'm not going to ask exactly what songs, but is it a mix of uh, your your own music and your originals, or or do you throw in some other ones too? Yeah. So we're going to do uh, some songs from our first record, The Bliss, and nice. a couple from uh, Hold Fast as well. They're all going to be hits. <laughs> so look all out. Hits. All hits, no misses. Um, my dad wanted me to make sure I play a couple of his favorites. So we're going to do that. And uh, yeah, just to add to what they were saying about, you know, I, I remember when we played with the NSO a number of years ago as well. It was kind of like, you know, the band that you hear in your head, you know, and, or, you know, wouldn't it be great if we had, you know, cellos and right. violins and oboes and timpanis and then you get to actually realize that sound. Uh, it's pretty incredible. So, and it's cool. so different, I guess, from the sound that Fortunate Ones typically has, with you and, and Kat having these like magical harmonies, and it's it's such beautiful and kind of peaceful music almost. Um, do you think, do you try to kind of keep the same feeling to it, or, or do you accept that there's going to be, you know, a whole different range of emotions in the, in the listener when they're hearing you play with the orchestra? I, I, I think at the end of the day, the kind of core of, of the music is is certainly the voices, but at the same time, it's like it's such a beautiful and rare gift to be able to surrender to such an amazing tapestry of sound. And, and it is also humbling to probably, I would say confidently, be the worst musicians in the room. <laughs> <laughs> it's cool. We're just floating along. It's all good. I can't speak for the once or the wise, but it's I've been learning humbling. how to read music yeah. on the way in here. <laughs> I'm like, okay, I, I want to know something of what they're talking about. And what's that process like when it is your own song that I guess presumably doesn't have an orchestral score um, that comes along with it, and you've got to, I guess, develop it between the orchestra and yourself. So what's that process? Boy, I don't know about you guys, but we just let them go and do their thing. I mean, there's a couple songs that uh, from our album Departures like that were done with more of an orchestral feel. But for the other stuff, it, it's kind of just, you know, the natural kind of instruments and just voice. So well, I, I don't even know what's going to happen. Like, this is going to be so exciting. Maybe <laughs> we should, like go in there with little cameras for before or something. And just see how it's going to go, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah we worked with uh, Jim Duff and Dwayne Andrews to do all of the arrangements for, for, the, uh, for the concert. Okay. So uh, they do a fantastic job. We've been working with Jim for quite a number of years and, and now uh, having Dwayne on board to do some of the arrangements as well. So we're really excited to hear those. Uh, Oh, they're amazing. Yeah. Yeah. And speaking of collaborations, uh, Sherman, you're yeah. actually singing with um, another one of Newfoundland's great musicians, yeah. uh, being Matthew Byrne. Yep. So how did that partnership come about? Well, actually, I guess you, you came to a show, Winter Island, last yep. year. Um, myself and Matthew Byrne have been doing for the last five years. We paired up uh, and have been doing a Winter Island tour every year. And it's kind of a strange pairing anyway, with both of our backgrounds being so different. But the, the tours have been great. And now this year, we are not doing the tour. Matthew had a baby. That's the end of it. <laughs> <laughs> Don't take that the wrong way. Uh, yeah, no, uh, he's, he's settling into a new family now, and, uh, and this gig is just a great gig. It's kind of like four of our tour gigs, <laughs> you know, all in one, with the attendance, and, and it's just going to be a great. Yeah, yeah, Matthew and I uh, have been playing together for so long now that it's where, just a nice where did you meet? friendship. Can I ask that? Of course, yeah. please. Where did you meet? Like, how did you where meet? Where did you meet? How did you Matthew get together? And I, Matthew and I were at the Music and L conference in Cornerbrook, or Okay. Oscar, and he was over for a cup of tea, and we got to chatting about how we love house concerts and, and intimate settings, and so we started doing a house concert tour on the island. Nice. Good friends. Wanted to say, Melissa, too, actually, that the NSO, it not only is it a fundraiser uh, for the Newfoundland Symphony Orchestra, it's also a diaper party. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. That's for Matthew Byrne. So if anyone, he's yeah. got That's a very a young son at home, yeah. oh, gotta be honest with you, full-time job changing the diapers. So if yeah. people yeah. want to bring diapers, yeah. feel free. We'll be collecting the intermission, yeah. Sure. Absolutely. <laughs> this could Just throw them from the sky. Yeah, I know. Yeah. People it's are great, totally yeah. coming in with diapers. <laughs> people sitting under the balcony, I guess. You know, Why did you make that happen? We'll have a moment what? where you can throw them all in. Yeah. <laughs> so this is going to be a good reunion for you. Is, uh, is yeah. the baby going to come on stage, too? Do I a little hope harmony. So. <laughs> That'd be great. <laughs> Perfect. Already playing. Yeah. <laughs> and I love hearing that you've got the new LB coming out this week. Yeah. Um, so that's great news. What I guess what kind of sound can we expect to hear on that? Uh, there are actually a lot of string arrangements on them. I had Kinley Dowling come in oh, from wow. uh, we used to play with Hey Rosetta. Mm -hmm. And um, 
Yeah, a lot of horns. Very, very different for me, I think. I'm excited about it. Wonderful. Yeah. Hugh, and I understand in addition to the musical talent, you also have a, a very special guest hosting it. So who, who's jumping into that role? We do, and that's uh, Mr. Pete Susi. So we're really excited. Um, we had Mark, of course, lined up, and uh, Mark's schedule uh, has been all over the place, and with 22 minutes, he's going to be busy on Friday night. So um, Pete stepped into the fray, and we're really excited about what he's going to bring to the table on Friday night as our host. And um, so this fundraiser slash diaper party that yes, we're doing, that's, <laughs> that's what it is. That's what it is. Right um, <laughs> it's, it's a major part of the NSO's uh, like funding and programming for the year. Um, so we're just wondering if you could explain to us a little bit about the significance of this of this event, and you know why it's so important and incredible that you have this this talent joining you for it. So thank you for that question. So it's uh, it's a good one. So we have uh, three major sponsors first for this particular concert, which is ExxonMobil, NSB Omega, and Coast 101.1 have been a fantastic media partner as well. So, you know, as a not-for-profit organization, you know, we really rely on fundraising. The, the ticket sales that we get throughout the year is only one part of that, but um, uh, the money that we can make from this kind of a fundraiser is, is huge to our, our operations, and our operations don't just include the concerts on stage. Our musicians are in schools every week um, visiting uh, uh, music classrooms and working with teachers on uh, getting to know classical music, classical instruments. Uh, in fact, our conductor was uh, out to a couple of schools today, so uh, that's a big part of our program as well. So all of this, this fundraising effort and these, these things that we do can contribute to that and other outreach activities that we do all year long. And on outreach, um, you know, do you find that having these types of shows where you bring in different genres and very well-known musicians in to play with the orchestra, do you get kind of, I guess, repeat customers, people who come in for an event like this and then say, oh, this orchestra is amazing and come back and back for more more of your kind of typical shows? We do, we do definitely, because, you know, the, the last few years we've really been looking at our mix of concerts and realizing, you know, we need to do some work to, to bring this orchestra out to a larger and more diverse audience, uh, particularly because, you know, um, the older people are getting older and our subscribers from years ago are, are moving away and doing other things as well. So we've really in the last few years increased our subscription base and um, we've been trying to do some more things like this, our Halloween concert, our superhero concert we have at the end of this season that are really going to bring in younger audiences and families and get them sort of interested in, in hearing the classical uh, instruments yeah. being played in that setting. and. And, uh, and hopefully it's something they can come to enjoy and love. What's the superhero concert? We have a, our, our last concert of the season. I'll come back and talk about that one. Don't want to steal your thunder, but our last concert of the it's season, okay. we have, a, um, we have a, a, a concert called Heroes and Villains uh, on, April tw on April 25th. Uh, so we're actually having a comic David of Best Kind Productions uh, write a, uh, a play uh, called Mabel Saves the Orchestra. And uh, uh, it'll be basically, we're going to have Marvel and DC uh, superhero music from movies, and we'll have a whole storyline built around that. Whoa. So we'll maybe maybe come back in for that. We're <laughs> free We're free for that. Free? Yeah, yeah, all right. I'm <laughs> tight, definitely. Yeah, we're in, eh? So no heroes and villains this one, but you do have the townies and the, I don't know, what do you call people from Corner Brook? <laughs> <laughs> the West Coasters? The West Coast, the best really coast. Right. right? We'll come up with something better <laughs> next time. <laughs> Edward Sherman, being from the West Coast, and Jerry, you're now living on the West Coast. Just moved. New yeah. neighbors. Yeah, but I feel like I'm in St. John more than before. Like, yeah. I feel like I come in now. Well, now I do. <laughs> I do. I really do. Like, I spent, usually when, when I lived here, when I came home, I just, like, huddled up a bit. Now when I come in, I, like, socialize, and I actually visit family, mm -hmm. and I got, like, a schedule, and... Now when I go to Cornbrook, I'm all stressed up and I hold up yes. my house. <laughs> <laughs> well, Jerry, we're very happy that you're back in town for this. Um, welcome home. Welcome Thank back you. to town. And uh, same to you, Sherman. And uh, Friday night's going to be uh, just an incredible show. And uh, looking forward to it. Yeah. Thanks for joining us. Thank, Thank, you. Thank you. All right. Thanks Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Right back with more Out of the Fog. All right, girls. Mom, you said it's played again. Workplace injuries hurt the most at home. What's the last thing you remember? What are you hiding? This thing kills everyone. Help me! 
No secrets. No secrets. Welcome back to Out of the Fog. I'm here with the co-hosts of Podco, a political podcast hosted right here in St. John's. And I'm here with Dr. Stephen Tomlin, Dr. Lori Lee Oates, and Dr. Lucian Ashworth. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Thanks for, for having you. us. So it's been an exciting time politically, and I know your podcast covers um, local and global politics and kind of on the ground practical stuff and theoretical and everything in between. But um, I gotta take you to the news of the last week, the Premier of Newfoundland and Labrador, <laughs> Dwight Ball stepping down, and now already we're into a leadership race. Um, Lori Lee, what are your thoughts on that so far? Well, for the bargain price of $25,000, you too can be Premier of Newfoundland and Labrador. Um, <laughs> so yeah, we had the rules come out yesterday. Uh, in approximately 74 days, we're going to have a new Premier, which mm -hmm. is really fast. Um, it's going to be pricey, right? They've raised the, the, the rates to en enter the race. And interestingly, they raised the um, upfront fee, because previously it was $5,000, I understand, and now it's $15,000. So uh, I guess there's some discussion out there about kind of the elite nature of that but from our perspective like we talk a lot about the difference between like what civil society wants and what government is actually doing and in this case what a party is doing and um, civil society wants campaign reform they don't want these expensive contests that um, people have to raise a lot of money and they're indebted to businesses or whatever I guess the pushback on that is that you know there are limits and twenty five thousand dollars is a lot of money obviously but um, you know if if you want to become premier of the province and leader of the party, you have to be able to organize and fundraise. That's a part of the job as leader of a political party. Um, I guess, what, what do you say to that kind of pushback on, on a, a big fee to enter the race? Well, it's, you know, it doesn't necessarily make you a more credible premier just because you've got contacts and within the business community and you've got that capacity to fundraise. In fact, it keeps it in the hands of a few people. You know, what we really need at this point is someone who uh, understands policy and is going to give us evidence-based policy and decision-making, someone who understands uh, the economy and someone who is going to give us, um, you know, better representation at the federal level. And Dr. Tomlin, what type of, I guess, aspects of a leadership race do you think that could be built in to exhibit those qualities, to make sure we get a, a, well, a leader in that way. I don't think you launch what we've launched. Um, what, people are really concerned, I think, in terms of executive domination or control. And people are, for the most part, spectators. And, and spectators who aren't really feeling like they're part of anything, and they don't trust those positions of power. So this kind of, you know, the, the premier suddenly uh, stepping down because of a number of scandals and policy failures and lack of details and information, and then, you know, launching this, this kind of, uh, uh, you know, initiative, this, this, this show, uh, where it's very limited, um, talking a little bit about democratic reform and, and kind of giving the excuse that, well, uh, we, we could have, we're waiting for the democratic reform process to, to, to go through. You're in charge. I mean, you're the ones that put that <laughs> committee in place. I mean, this is, this is not something that is new. It doesn't, it doesn't really uh, require uh, much, uh, you know, in terms of planning. You, you could have set up the rules. You could have engaged the general population. Uh, you, you could have created a situation where there is this kind of sense that people are manipulating, uh, that they are, they are isolating, uh, they are making it difficult for the general population to run if, if, if they wanted to. So I think uh, how this has been launched, this is supposed to be exciting. Leadership is about renewal. But there's this kind of sense that this is not about renewal. This is kind of the same old, the same old. And I think it's, it's, it's not good for the party, and I don't think it's good for the people who want to run for that party, because it, it really kind of, most of their discussion is about uh, responding to what they have created, and it, it's self-created. And so the candidates are going to be going around explaining how is it, why is it that we have this, this system set up the way it is and the process is set up the, the way it is. And I think that uh, obviously uh, it's a mistake. I don't think that this is what they should have been doing. And Lucian, your two co-hosts have now mentioned the term democratic reform. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, that's kind of a, it's a buzzworthy uh, term. I know it's been around a while, but we hear it a lot lately. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in your perspective as a political scientist, how, what would you tell your students? What is democratic reform and what are we looking for here? Well, I think it's very particular to, um, to whatever jurisdiction you're talking about. But I think with, uh, there's a lot of talk at the moment about uh, how vague 
uh, a lot of the talk of democratic reform is. But I, I think that's, uh, that's the wrong approach to take. I think what we're dealing with here actually is a, a political system, and it comes back to something that things that Laurie and Steve have been talking about, a political system that mm. has really um, been coasting for a long time. And I think it's not so much that the calls for democratic reform are vague, but that the list of what's required going back several decades uh, is very, very long. And I think we've seen that with a lot of the civil society groups that have been pushing for democratic reform. What they're finding is they're having to break out into committees because there's a hell of a lot that needs to be done. And in fact, uh, uh, Laurie, your piece in the, uh, uh, that you wrote for the CPC uh, quite a while ago okay, contained quite a, a long shopping list. And it's not because people are being overambitious, it's because we haven't done this for a long time. Right. So what are some of those uh, shopping list items? You know, if, if you could pick some priorities for democratic Democratic reform in this province, what would they be? Well, and there's been lots of work done on it, too. Yeah. Um, like, uh, the preeminent group watchdog federally is um, Democracy Watch, and they talk about things like campaign finance reform, electoral reform, consultations, hiring processes, access to government information, government record-keeping. Um, I mean, there's, there's no shortage of work to be done, but the thing is, it has to be an ongoing process, right? Making our democracy more perfect mm -hmm. has to be a priority always, and that means it needs a standing committee, and it means it needs a resourced secre secretariat just like other things have in government. And part, part of the problem is federal reform, or lack, lack thereof. So that whether we're talking about mitigation, whether we're talking about you know, equalization, whether we're talking about a lot of challenges and problems having to do with the environment or energy or what have you, the challenge or problem is that, for the most part, premiers go behind closed doors with Ottawa on a bilateral basis and then basically just report what they've agreed to or, or, or very few details in terms of what they've actually agreed to. So we need a, a combination of controlling the power of the executive in terms of federal-provincial relations, but we also need to think about democratic reform within each of the provinces, because many of the provinces, there isn't really an opportunity for citizens to engage, and there certainly isn't very much opportunity at the executive federal level. So I think we need a combination of democratic reform, but we also need federal reform. And uh, Dr. Oates, I need to take you back to the uh, Liberal leadership race, because um, you and I share this in common. We're both involved with Equal Voice, an organization That's that right. um, advocates for women in politics. And you're on the national board, so, mm -hmm. and I, I know you've written a lot about women in politics as well. You know, in all of the names that came forward or were kind of rumored to enter this leadership race, you know, most, if not all of them, were men. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and it's wonderful to see men come forward and have people come forward to, you know, put their names out there. But what do you think are some of the barriers? Like, why did we not see women, um, you know, enter this race or even kind of be in the public conversation about uh, putting their names forward? Well, the research is pretty clear on that, right? The media does women no favors. The media tends to see men as kind of the traditional canon of leader and politician. Um, the way that media covers uh, female politicians is harmful in that um, it, it, it is harmful to women trying to get elected, but it also keeps other women from running. The research, I don't think, is even out on social media yet. I doubt social media is helpful to women. Um, but we just, we naturally elevate men, right? Um, you know, business leaders in the city who, you know, haven't even been able to get elected to a seat are being tapped as, you know, kind of natural here appearance when women who were in cabinet are being overlooked. Um, and women don't always necessarily have the kind of the same networks to do the fundraising either. Um, and, you know, they, they don't necessarily want to go into the dark fray in the same way that <laughs> men do. <laughs> the dark fray, the dark fray of politics. But, of course, that's a fray that you guys go into fairly often, not, you know, necessarily running, but discussing and learning about and educating people on. And so I want to talk more about your podcast and and it's I guess you're coming into your second season kind of of it now second season, mm -hmm, right yeah. and it's uh, it's called podco which is a great name mm -hmm. so where, I, I have to ask you where did you come up with that name how did uh, how did you think of, of that for a politics podcast I that was you obviously. yeah well we wanted to pay hom homage to Codco mm -hmm. um, and part of it is too like we talk a lot about getting off the imperial economy and we're really invested in that the arts economy right and the fact that this province produces is, you know, such wonderful comedians and artists and writers and musicians. Um, and one of our first episodes, actually, we had Bob Hollett mm -hmm. on, right, talking about, um, you know, come from away in Great Big Sea. Um, 
and you, you know, we, we really, um, we, we want to make the point that, um, you know, we do have it going on here mm -hmm. and we can do things besides natural resources and oil and gas. And CODCO is connected with the community and we want to be connected with the community. We want to engage with the community. We want to talk about inequality. We want to talk about things that for the most part aren't on the radar screen. So we're pushing to have that on the radar screen. And I think, as I said, I think we've been fairly effective in terms of doing that. And Lucy, what are some of the, um, I guess, topics we can look forward to you discussing in the next coming weeks? Right, okay. We've got so, so economy is big. <laughs> big, absolutely. Um, and health care. Yeah. Um, and inequality, yeah. we, we inequality just recorded we just this, morning. this week. People yeah. in politics, women, diversity, yeah. decolonization of government. Mm -hmm. And where can people hear your podcast? So we run on CHMR, yeah, sure. yep. the MUN radio station, every Friday at 5 o'clock. And usually shortly after that, you can get us on all the kind of major um, downloading services like iTunes, um, Google Play, SoundCloud, and there's mm. one more that I'm forgetting. Everywhere is the Everywhere. short answer. Yeah, basically. If you, <laughs> no, we follow our, Twitter yeah, lot, if you follow yeah. our Twitter, okay. uh, a pod, at Podco1, um, uh, then that usually has the links as well. So, uh, Wonderful. Yeah. And well, Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> Everywhere. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks so much for joining us again. I'll be listening and looking forward to chatting with you again soon. Yeah. Thanks for having thanks. us. Thanks Thank for you. having us. We'll be back with more Out of the Fog. Call the Rogers TV viewer response line, email us, or connect with us on social media. Thanks to all the guests who joined us on tonight's Out of the Fog. Uh, be sure to check out Podco on CHMR or wherever you get your podcasts and get tickets for the NSO's big ticket event coming up this Friday night at Mile One Center. You can get them online at the Mile One website or in person at the box office. But be sure to do so because it's going to be a fantastic show. Thanks again to all our guests, and we'll see you next time on Out of the Fog.